Good morning to our audience here in North America. Good afternoon or good evening to those around the world. I'm Damon Wilson, President and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. Thank you all for attending this very special broadcast organized by the endowment, along with our great partners, the National Democratic Institute and the International Republican Institute. We are so pleased to welcome back to the endowment, Nathan Law. Nathan will be speaking in conversation with our very own NED board member, Ann Applebaum, about his remarkable new book, Freedom, How We Lose It, and How We Fight Back. But this event is not just about Nathan's fantastic book, which I encourage you all to read. This event is about spotlighting the most dramatic rollback of freedom that we have seen in the past year as the Chinese Communist Party has so cynically and forcefully implemented the national security law, crushing Hong Kong's long tradition of rule of law. The reach and the speed of Beijing's actions should give pause to anyone around the world in their relationship with China, and they should energize those who value freedom to rally around Hong Kongers today. To this end, this event is also about democratic solidarity and collective action. I am proud that today's program is the first time we will have hosted a public event with Hong Kong, Chinese, Uyghur, and Tibetan activists to talk about working in solidarity, to push back on the CCP, and to build democratic resilience. This cooperation is essential as a strategy in the face of Beijing's attack on freedom. The endowment for its part is proud to facilitate such a solidarity building opportunity. And to this end, after a conversation between Nathan and Anne, they will be joined by Pema Doma from Students for Free Tibet, Zumratai Arkin of the World Uyghur Congress, and Chinese human rights lawyer and academic, Dr. Tang Biao, for a discussion on solidarity building and sustaining democratic movements in exile. In 2017, Nathan Law was the youngest person in Hong Kong history ever elected to the Legislative Council winning more than 50,000 votes in the Hong Kong Island constituency. Despite winning nearly 50,000 more votes than Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, who was selected for her position with only 777 pre-selected electors, Nathan was disqualified from his seat in an unprecedented unilateral decision from the central government in Beijing. Nathan first gained prominence as a student leader during the 2014 umbrella movement protests. He was one of five representatives who took part in dialogue with the government on political reform. Following his success in peaceful civic organizing, he joined Joshua Wong and other student leaders in founding the political party Demosisto. Nathan, Joshua, and Alex Chow were jailed in 2017 for their peaceful protest actions in 2014. And while Nathan and Alex are now in exile. Joshua Wong remains imprisoned in Hong Kong today. I want to offer a special welcome to Alex, who's with us here in DC, as we remember Joshua. The three of them were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 in recognition of their peaceful efforts to bring political reform to Hong Kong. Nathan has also been recognized as Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People and was winner of the Reader's Poll. In 2020, following the promulgation of the draconian national security law, Nathan was forced into self-exile from Hong Kong and now lives in London. He recently helped found the Hong Kong Umbrella Community, an organization based in London aimed at connecting Hong Kong people around the United Kingdom and preserving Hong Kong culture and identity. He is also the convener of the advisory board of the Hong Kong Democracy Council, an organization based in Washington focused on advocacy and outreach on Hong Kong issues. Anne Applebaum, of course, is a leading public intellectual, a staff writer for The Atlantic, and serves on the board of the directors of the endowment, as I mentioned. Her illustrious career has spanned many years in journalism in both the United States and Europe, where she has covered democratic movements, authoritarianism, and the importance of civil society. Anne's journalism and commentary have provided key insights into the inner workings of authoritarians and the resilience of democratic activists and civil society organizations in the face of immense adversity. Her latest piece for The Atlantic, The Bad Guys Are Winning, 
traces the inroads authoritarians around the globe have made against liberal democracy, developing new tools of repression based in surveillance, subterfuge, and disinformation. It's a must read. So please join me in welcoming Nathan Law and Apple and Applebaum for a conversation on freedom. I'm really delighted to be here today, kind of spiritually and virtually with Nathan Law. Um, this is his new book. Um, I suggest that you all buy it and read it. Um, uh, the, the way our conversation is going to work this morning is that I'm going to speak to Nathan mostly about the story he tells in the book, which is the story of his life and of, of the, the, the problem and conflict that have been created in Hong Kong by the harshening regime, Chinese regime. Um, then after about half an hour, we're going to be joined by three other um, uh, Chinese activists and uh, Chinese Uyghur Tibetan activists who will and in that part of the conversation we will focus not just on the problem, but also on what some of the solutions might be. Um, but let me begin um, with Nathan. Nathan, I assume you can hear me. Yes. Everything? Yeah, yeah, very well. Okay, okay very good. I, I, I'd like to start um, if, if we could start with some a, a, a personal part of your story. Um, one of the interesting things you write, the book is partly autobiographical, it's partly political. Um, one of the one, one thing that you write about is that you were not born into a political or a dissident family. Um, can you talk a little bit about what moved you to become part of politics? How did you join? What was your path into, into what eventually became dissent? Although, of course, it didn't start as dissent. It started as, um, as participation in public life. Oh, well, um, thank you so much, Anne, for the question. And um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for Annette and um, II and NDI for inviting me to this event. I think this is a crucial event because um, I've been trying um, so hard to advocate for Hong Kong's democratic movement and push forward the voice of countering China's rise of authoritarianism. And I think this is an important initiative um, to speak directly to policymakers and, and to people um, who are really in the position to bring a change. And, um, and thank you so much, Anne, for hosting um, these events. For me, I, I think my story is quite different from a lot of people may have imagined how a, like a political um, so-called star would be look like. Um, for me, my, my father came to um, Hong Kong from China in late 70s when there were no food. Uh, there was a great famine in his village. And the only hope to survive was to escape and to be in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was the land of hope and refuge for their generation. But for now, as we can see, there are just more and more people leaving Hong Kong because of political persecution. Hong Kong no longer mean refuge for them. It means persecution. It means repression. And I think this is a great irony of history. I grew up in this background. My father didn't really talk about politics because he felt like it was just too much for him. He just wanted his next generation to live in a stable life, just get away from all those political toy mao. But eventually I, I, I had my political awakening, which I narrated uh, in the book, detailedly about um, how I learned about the work from um, the Nobel Peace Prize, um, Lawrence Liu Xiaobo, and went to the first um, 4th of June candlelight vigil. It had a huge impact in my life and it basically completely changed the trajectory of it. I was no longer a person who, um, in all my head, tried to provide on the table, to put food on the table, to take care of my family. Where they are blue collar workers, I sometimes struggle in my childhood um, in terms of economic situation. Um, but for now, I have a um, greater um, goal for, for, for my life, which is try to contribute to Hong Kong, to, to fight for. Um, the whole generation and, and, and the whole city. So you were inspired by the the, the Chinese Nobel Prize winner, um, and what and and what was the path that led you directly into you know for example how did you become involved in the first Occupy Hong Kong uh, demonstrations in 2014? What was the um, what were the steps that you took to to, to do that? Yeah, when I was in 2014, I was elected as the head of the student union in my university. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, I didn't really want to commit myself into a so-called career of activism. 
I remember that when I was elected, I promised myself it was just one year term. After that, I would just go back to school and um, to take care of my academic um, performance, which was, which was not good due to the heavy workload that I had to spend in student union. And I tried to have an exchange program and do things like an ordinary university student. But um, as you were more involved, you witness a lot of injustice. You witness your fellow getting arrested. They're getting badly treated by the police. And for me, it's a gradual process to consolidate your faith and to continue to, um, to have a mindset that you just have to commit more and more. At the beginning of um, my term, I remember that the Occupy Central movement, which was uh, a movement encouraging civil disobedience actions in order to fight for the, uh, democracy in Hong Kong, they had a um, deliberation day in my college. In my college and they distribute um, kind of like um, questionnaire and to ask participants, in what level are you willing to be involved? Whether you are someone who would like to be arrested to commit like civil disobedience to, 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 to fulfill that goal, or you are just um, someone who don't want to take the risk to be the bad end supporter. I remember that I, I actually chose the one to be a bad end supporter. I didn't want to get arrested at the beginning um, because I, I, I just imagined that I will have an um, ordinary life afterwards. But I think it, it's just how a conscious people behave when you are continue to be exposed with all those injustices and um, you understand that you have the responsibility and the capacity to do more and then you're gradually being dragged into um, the act of activism. Uh, I've quoted um, Val Val um, uh, Havel's um, quote about how people not to choose become decent, but they they are gradually uh, becomes it when you just speak the truth and when you just follow your conscience. And I think that was exactly my case. I never intend to be a politician, a legislator, an activist. Um, but my conscience made me to do so. And can I ask you, what was it that changed in Hong Kong in 2014 that, that, that made these demonstrations possible and necessary? Was it a change in the mentality of Hong Kong people? Was it, the, was it a change in the, in, the, you know, in, the, in the attitude of China towards Hong Kong? Can you describe what was it that launched that moment? Because that was really the important moment then led to later um, later protests? I think that was a big sense of betrayal uh, Hong Kong people felt in 2014 when they were promised in the 1980s, uh, when the British government and the Chinese government were negotiating Hong Kong's future, um, they were promised um, democracy, autonomy, and freedom after 1997, when Hong Kong was handed back uh, to the Chinese government. And they waited and waited, and they wait a few terms of elections of chief executive but that promise of democracy uh, ha had not arrived. So they, they, they felt like they must to do, do something in order to tell the Beijing government that they should not drag the process of Hong Kong democratization. So I think in 2014, um, a lot of Hong Kong, Hong Kong people already felt very impatient about it. And um, there was a large group of Occupy Central Movement ongoing, really bringing the first time uh, um, the idea of massive civil, civil disobedience actions, uh, mostly inspired by Dr. King's action in civil rights movement uh, to implement it in Hong Kong and to use that kind of action to empower, enlighten Hong Kong people and also pressure Chinese governments. So I think it was um, a, a conglomeration of um, public sentiment, individuals' bravery and commitment and also about the time that we, we, are, we were in the political reform, reform discussion and people were just trying to find ways to participate. Mm -hmm. And between 2014 and then the later demonstrations in 2019 and 2020, um, I, I know that the, you were out of the country for part of that time, you eventually came back, um, uh, but the, the the tactics of Hong Kong people changed in that time, and the, and the demonstrations were a little bit different the second time. 
What had you learned from the first set of de demonstrations, the ones that you were so closely involved in, um, and the second, the second wave? And how how were they different? And you know, in what way do you think they were successful or not successful? In the 2019 protest movement, it was an inspiration for every one of us. Um, it was nothing like any other protest movement, um, at least in Hong Kong. It was a decentralized one, but it was heavily relying on um, the tech-savvy nature of Hong Kong people that they could um, initiate online debate, online voting, and lib uh, deliberation, and utilizing their own talents and their own skills in different sectors of the whole movement. Um, when we talk about the 2019 movement, it was decentralized because um, there were some lessons learned from the 2014 movement. For example, when uh, there, there was a clear leadership in 2014 movement, when leaders were arrested, uh, it, it could be easily cracked. Uh, when there were leaders, um, maybe the conflicts in, in the camp would intensify um, because people would argue about their representation, would argue about their ability, especially in Hong Kong. We, we've got um, not that much um, kind of like consolidation of a alliance on, on resistance movement and in 2019, they, they have adopted, a, 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 or we have adopted a model of um, really a flat and less hierarchical participation. I think it was actually a much more direct, uh, a demonstration of direct, direct deliberation and democracy uh, in terms of in the democratic movement. So I think those are good aspects of it, but of course, um, uh, it also has this weakness that when, whenever the, the sentiment of the people was um, really triggered, intimidated by, by, by the government, um, then sometimes uh, there would be engagement of actions or violence that we may not necessarily want to see it. Um, but I think this is, um, an, well, it's difficult to, to put harsh blame on it when we see the government had been abusing the police power, um, committing a lot of police violence, while there are no checks and balances in the whole system. Up until now, there are none of the police force uh, officers who have committed uh, police brutalities in Hong Kong are held accountable, while there are just countless cases of it. Um, even they were promoted or praised by the government for cracking down the protest. Um, so it's, it's really, for, for the, a lot of the protesters, they, the, the only thing they could think of to deter the police force from um, using violence for them was also to use the use of force to deter them. And I think that is just a tragedy because of the inaction of the government and deliberate um, encouragement on using excessive force on protesters so that they have to respond it by also the escalation of force. The only way to address that was to make sure that we have a mechanism to hold these human rights perpetrators accountable. And that's why I think um, sanctioning, me sanctioning mechanism on the international community, including the US, um, should be utilized more in order to um, express that signal. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about a couple of other things. One, one of them is um, you mentioned Dr. King. Um, you've also mentioned Václav Havel. What, what were the other inspirations for the Hong Kong democracy movement, both in its earlier form and its later form? I mean, do, were, you, were, were you and your colleagues uh, reading about democracy movements in other places? And were you reading about them in history? Um, what, what gave you the idea that this could work? Well, um, I think for Hong Kong people, we, we've been really paying a close attention to the struggles um, in the region, uh, in Southeast Asia, because um, in the past few years, there, there, there have been a lot of protests in Myanmar, in Thailand, in some other places that they are also calling for an end uh, to dictatorship, fighting for democracy. And by then, there was an interesting phenomenon on the internet that we had a milk tea alliance, that a lot of democratic campaigners and, and supporters that they found a, a virtual community online to support each other, to amplify each other's voice, and to 
um, create an identity that we have a role in each other's protest movement so that um, all these movements can more or less form in one uh, to, to have one platform to amplify each our own voices. So I think these are, are really interesting examples of how we amplify our voice and we, we take a lot of reference from um, Thai, Thai, Thai protest or even Taiwan's protest mm -hmm. uh, about how we can really um, try to do something in that very close political um, landscape. Um, but for me, of course, um, when I was in jail, um, I was there for a couple of months. Uh, I read a lot of autobiography from great leaders uh, in civil rights movement around the world or, or liberation movement um, because uh, it, they, they have suffered much more than I, uh, to be honest. I, I was not the one who suffered the most. Um, there are lots of Hong Kong protesters that are sentenced to years. Even my friend Joshua he has been in jail for a year and we still have no idea when he could get out because the verdict has not come out yet. It could be decades. Um, so, um, but for me, it, it was not a pleasant time to spend time in jail and you just have to find courage to the great leaders who had suffered much more than you, but they could still hang on. And why they, they still, still could do that, um, where did their courage come from? Um, where, what, what were their inspiration? By reading these things, um, it really empowers me. It really keeps my things. And I think these are a uh, uh, major source of support um, spiritually when I was in a very difficult situation. One of the other things that you write about in your book is the experience of being attacked by disinformation. So it wasn't just that you were in prison. It wasn't just that you were elected to the legislature and then removed from your seat. Um, you, you've also been lied about and smeared in the, in the press in Hong Kong and in China. Um, I, I have a very small experience of that, much, much less than yours. Um, um, but I'd like to know how, first of all, how do, you, how do you cope with that and how do you fight back against it? I mean, this must be something that you deal with almost every day. This information campaign is one of the most common tactics for the Chinese government to stigmatize um, activists to try to discredit us, not only individually, but on a collective level. They have been also smearing the whole protest movement as um, initiated and funded by foreign governments, so to denounce our pursuit for democracy. Um, and th these are really common. Um, for me, uh, sometimes it's more than that. I've been disinvited by conferences just because their Chinese investor pressured them not to invite me after actually they have they had extended the invitation to me and I agreed to speak. And I had encounters about um, going to events while uh, the Chinese student organization writing letters to the organizer saying that you have to cancel the events, otherwise it will endanger the China and that university's relationship. And there were protests uh, where I, I, I was in, in those sites and they are citing misinformation to attack me. There's just so many um, examples of how the Chinese government could use, could flex its muscle and to make lies uh, to be so, so prevalent and so as long as they can. Yeah, you're talking about the Chinese government outside of China using its influence, for example, in American universities and at other kinds of conferences. It, yes, it definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and those things are, are, we just have to be aware of that. But of course, like in mainland China, they have controlled all the media, all the, all, all, all the outlet of it. Um, it's much easier for them to do it um, than, than in, on the international level. So I think this is also something that not only for me, but a lot of diasporic activists and exile activists, they also have to face. It, was, it, it is the deplatforming, uh, it is the uh, discrediting actions from the Chinese government. And I think one of the things that the community can support each other and um, institutions like um, uh, what we have now um, can support each other is to provide that platform, is to provide that voice for them um, because they are actually facing um, tremendous pressure from this authoritarian regime to try to silence them. So you mean you can help provide a platform outside of China for people who are still inside China? Um, well, definitely. Um, we would just have to bear in mind that the influence of these authoritarian regimes are, are definitely across border. They have very extensive arms. 
And especially when they can flex like their economic muscle, it makes much easier for them to pressure those organizations, TV stations, uh, uh, radio to try to disengage with dissents who are critical for them. And I think um, in that sense, um, the civil society in the US and on the inter international community, we, 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 we should do something to provide platform and to protect these dissents from these intimidation. So one of the things that I've written about recently, Damon alluded to it in his introduction, is exactly this. It's both the way in which autocratic regimes now work to support one another. Um, you spoke a minute ago about democracy movements elsewhere in, in Asia um, and how they need to support one another precisely because um, governments in the region, but also governments all over the world, now uh, autocratic governments now take uh, you know, advice, they borrow tactics, sometimes they, you know, they use money some offered by China or sometimes by Russia um, in order to su suppress democracy. So there's now almost a kind of international um, anti-democratic alliance, even between countries that are very different, um, that have nothing in common ideologically, you know, China and Iran and Cuba, um, which, you know, and, 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 and Russia, which actually are not not similar in the way they describe themselves, but they're similar in their use of tactics. Um, um, we'll, we'll get to this, I think, in the following conversation, but maybe you could, when we bring together, you know, a wider group of, of, of activists, um, but maybe you could start us thinking about that, um, given that there is this international network, you know, given that China has influence even inside the US, even inside Europe, um, uh, you know, given that um, all of these regimes now, you know, borrow money and tactics and, you know, and, and sometimes even, you know, surveillance equipment from one another. Um, how should the international democracy movement be thinking about that? Should we be thinking differently? Should we also be thinking in terms of networks? Um, and, and how do we begin doing that? It's obvious that um, dictators are working closely and working even more um, connect. They're, they're even more connected than before. Um, for me, it, it's also a uh, well, definitely for activist camp. We need to strategize and we need to increase understandings across our movement. But also, it is the responsibility also lies to democratic countries. We we just have to work uh, together and to form much closer alliance than we have now. Um, and this is uh, also a point that I mentioned in my speech in the Summer for Democracy, which we have to see this rise of authoritarianism, this togetherness for them as a global crisis. It's literally a crisis for, that, for us for the past two decades. While we have been too complacent about it, um, not until like recent one or two years, we have a awakening about the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and we've opened up the door for them to engage in our international system, to engage in our um, global trade, but without developing mechanism to hold them accountable. Um, I think this is really a major factor why we are in the state of decline of democracy and our democratic values. In order to counter it, we, we, we need to have a perceptual change. We need to see it as an existential crisis. We need to see it as equivalent to climate change equivalent to arms proliferation is something that we must amass resources and we must set up agenda, global agenda and global actions to address that. Otherwise, relying on individual countries, uh, it, it is not gonna work. And it is proven that it is not working. So, um, I mean, activist protest movement, we have to increase our understanding and our network before the democracies who really have the resources and have the influence on that level, they also should increase their collaboration and see it treated um, as serious as they can. Mm -hmm. So there's in, there, in, in a way, there's a connection between the attack on the Hong Kong democracy movement and the decline of democracy in established democracies as well. Um, in that the you know we're we're all part of the we're all the targets really of authoritarian or autocratic um, disinformation campaigns and smear campaigns and by working together we can push back against them together is that what you're arguing? Um, yes, definitely. Um, I, I think of course uh, we've been seeing the decline of democracy in also democracies. Um, 
And in the book, I've narrated um, basically how um, the Hong Kong government utilized its authoritarian toolbox to erode the freedoms in Hong Kong. And it is meant to be not only for people in Hong Kong, but, but I, I really do hope that it has a global implication um, by understanding how this unchecked government, that they could use different tactics, for example, criminalizing investigative journalism, buying out all the media outlet in order to change their uh, uh, um, like uh, reporting style, um, treating journalists badly on, on protest sites, et cetera. There are a lot of these authoritarian toolbox that our government could do to erode our freedom. It is a warning sign to the people living in democracy that if you see these signs, if you um, are aware of the government doing things like this, you should be uh, you should pay attention to it. And when it's necessary, you should stand up and say that uh, this is our freedom. Um, the most um, important message in the book um, to the international audience is please don't take freedom and democracy for granted. In Hong Kong, we've lost merely all our freedom in just a year after the implementation of the national security law. Our largest independent union was disbanded. Our largest free media was disbanded. Many of the political organizations who have been supporting Hong Kong civil society for decades, they're also forced to disband. And we've got um, the, the organization that hosts uh, the 4th of June candle night vigil every year. They are, it, it was also disbanded and their staff were facing prosecution under the national security law. It was just so quick. And it, it is the result of an unchecked balance under that enormous support from a totalitarian regime. It may not be as drastic when you put the context in democratic countries, but when you see signs of it, um, people should stand up and to be a guardians of freedom, um, not only the recipient of it. Yes, I was very struck by how your list of, um, you know, your, your list of your description of this authoritarian toolbox did include um did include tools that we've seen used in established democracies over the last few years i mean just to take you know just the attack on the media alone um the attempt to buy up or undermine uh free media is something that we've seen happen in hungary um you know the the attack on free media you know the description of it as fake news and so on is something we've had in the united states um and so the you know you can see the ways in which these attacks on the um, you know, the, the, the institutions that can hold governments accountable, um, those can happen anywhere, whether in Hong Kong or America or Brazil or, 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 or in any established democracy, regardless of their history and their geography and their background. Well, definitely. Um, I think um, this decline in, in established democracy, they're also a result of um, the propaganda of um, how authoritarian regime could say that, oh, they have a much better system, they're a more efficient system, they have uh, less problems than in democracies. That's what uh, the Chinese government has been saying. But when we think of propaganda like this, uh, we just have to bear in mind that there is no press freedom in mainland China. All the outlets are controlled by the party organs. They will definitely show you the best side of China. It is uh, the reason why we have a perception that everything from them are doing good was because they never say what are the bad things in their own country, while in a free, free country that we, we, we've got all the freedom to report them. So it creates a perceptual um, discrepancy. Um, and I think that that's why we, we must boost our understanding towards the Chinese government and China, China's reality. And um, we just have to counter those narratives aggressively and to make sure that, um, that what they've been doing to their own people, especially those human rights atrocities, we have to properly address them in order to also um, give a clearer sight to our people about the reality of this authoritarian regime and try to stop them from boosting their legitimacy, boosting their credibility inside our own system. So thank you, um, Nathan. I'm now gonna move to the second part of our event today. Um, and I'm going to welcome our co-panelists um, for a broader discussion on democracy activism in exile and solidarity building. Um, let me introduce them. There are one or two who are in the room at, at NED. I don't know if the camera is going to shift to include them. Um, presumably, yes. 
and then there are one or two who are joining us online. Um, there we go. So first, let me introduce Pima Doma, who's joining us in the room in Washington. She's a Tibetan activist and the campaign manager of Students for a Free Tibet. Uh, she's been a prominent voice calling for a boycott of the Beijing 2022 Olympic Games, and she works on building solidarity between different marginalized communities. Um, also joining us in the room is Dr. Teng Biao, who is a prominent voice in the Chinese democracy movement on mainland China, a human rights lawyer and academic, and he's currently the Hauser Human Rights Scholar at Hunter College and a Posen visiting professor at the University of Chicago. Um, he previously co-founded two human rights NGOs in Beijing, um, China Against the Death Penalty uh, and the Open Constitution Initiative. Um, he has defended cases including Uyghurs, Tibetans, um, issues of religious freedom and freedom of expression, and he has re he's received the Human Rights Prize of the French Republic and the National Endowment for Democracy's Democracy Award. Um, and finally, Zamratai uh, Arkin, who's joining us virtually from Germany, uh, is a Uyghur activist and is the program and advocacy manager at the World Uyghur Congress. Uh, she's president of the Uyghur Center for Democracy and Human Rights and was recently elected chair of the World Uyghur Congress Women's Committee. Um, she's a leader on grassroots campaigns on the Olympics, as well as with the coalition to end forced Uyghur labor. So you see we have here a really unusual and impressive spectrum of people who know and understand China from, from different points of view. Um, and I'm going to try to focus the conversation in such a way that we get, um, we understand the range of what it is that they do. Um, but let, let me start by asking all of you, um, what does it mean to sustain a democratic movement in exile? Um, all of you now live outside of your country. Um, and all of you therefore need to use modern tools in order to communicate with people inside the country. Um, you also are in a special position because you understand Western, you know, the Western America and Germany and the, the Western world in which you live and you have, um, you know, you're able to have some influence and make some impact here. Um, maybe I could start by asking what are the different approaches that Hong Kongers, Uyghurs, Tibetans and mainland Chinese activists have to sustaining and inculcating democratic values in the diaspora, or maybe there aren't differences, but could, could you talk a little bit about what it means to be abroad and, um, and how you can, you know, how you can maintain your role even outside your country? Um, maybe I'll, I'll start by turning first to Zamritai, um, who's in, in Germany. Thank you, um, and, and thanks for having me here. Um, I think this is a good question. Um, I think it's it starts with conversations. Um, it really, I think most of the time uh, when I engage in conversations with people and share a little bit about my my personal story, the fact that I have lost everything um, that is dear to me, my homeland, my family members, um, people react to, to that. Um, and I think there's no better way to advocate for your people's rights than by starting to share something personal. And I think um, now that we have social media tools available to us widely everywhere, it's so easy to share something. For example, I can just today start a campaign on the missing relatives that I have using uh, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and this uh, using this democratizes the information. It makes it widely available to everyone um, around, the, around the world. And people can pick up on that. You know, Twitter is a great tool with, um, and I think you have to also learn how to use each social media. Um, uh, you know, Twitter is great to engage with journalists and, and uh, policy makers. So, uh, social uh, media like Instagram is good for to reach out to celebrities or influencers. And it's just, I think, adapting your, your message as well, because um, I think, uh, for example, what you say to, to congressmen or congresswomen is not necessarily uh, what's going to be uh, I guess picked up if you if you talk to someone else, for example, a journalist or or just an ordinary citizen. So I think it's also knowing the differences between these platforms and um, knowing uh, your audience is is crucial in in this process. 
And how about reaching people at home? Are you able to reach, you know, back into Xinjiang or is that obviously that's more difficult? Um, that is extremely difficult. I've lost contact with my family since 2017 altogether. Um, so for me, even if I had the opportunity to talk to them, I wouldn't risk it because they could be jailed, they could be interned because of their connection to me. Um, for example, I know through some sources that my, my family members are being interrogated because of the work that I do. So uh, putting them at risk is, is not an option for me. So uh, knowing you know, what they think or what the Uyghur people think as in general in the country is extremely difficult. But I guess this is only, sometimes there are some leaks um, on social media, uh, but it's, it's very difficult to get, um, to obtain information uh, from within the country. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask now, Pima, you know, the Tibetan movement has been established in exile for more than 60 years. Um, are there lessons in, in, you know, how to use that status that you can share with Hong Kongers or with other more recent activists in exile? Uh, thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you for all the organizers and those that are here today for joining us. Um, as Anne mentioned, my name is Pema and I'm the campaign director for Students for Free Tibet. Um, I think first and foremost, there are so many lessons that like myself as a young Tibetan have learned from Hong Kong activists like Nathan I remember being in university and seeing the work that students like Nathan were doing in Hong Kong. And this, we're not living in a vacuum. There are so many lessons we've learned from Uyghur activists who are so brave, such as Zumretai, who has, you know, I think it's upwards of four natives um, that are currently detained in camps right now. And seeing their work, uh, what I've kind of realized is that we're not living in a vacuum. Um, with the age of technology, activists from the Tibetan community, Uyghur community, and Hong Kong community have really seen and learned a lot from one another. Um, and I'm really thankful for all of their work as well and the lessons I've learned from them. Uh, in terms of the Tibetan movement, I think for someone like myself, my father was born in Tibet and when he was a young child, he walked over the Himalayas and my mom spent most of her childhood living in a refugee school um, along with uh, thousands of other Tibetan refugees in India. Um, for me, you know, I, was, I grew up outside of Tibet pretty much uh, my whole lifetime, my, outside of my homeland. And what I've seen is that increasingly there are thousands and increasing, closing to like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of young Tibetans who, who have similar upbringings in exile. And I think the lessons that we've learned from that is that, um, unfortunately, I, I hope not, but it's possible that in the coming generations, Uyghur and Hong Konger communities could also experience a time where there are so many young Tibetan, young Uyghurs or Hong Kongers who have grown up without seeing their homeland with their own eyes. And I think the lesson that I've learned for the furthering of democracy back in the homeland is that in order to keep the movements alive, in order to keep them vibrant and um, kind of visible around the world, uh, there needs to be uh, sustainability processes like uh, trainings or programs where uh, we can make that um, accessible for young people that grow up in diaspora to learn about the issues and also to become effective change makers um, and to amplify the voices of those that are back in the homeland. Uh, so I'll just share one quick story about a Tibetan inside Tibet named Kunchok Jimpa. Uh, he was a climate activist and what he did was he uh, took stories from inside his community in Tibet uh, called Juru, where they were building uh, illegal extractive mines inside Tibet, the Chinese government was. And so Tunchuk Jinpa would take that information and funnel it into exile so that people outside that cared about climate change, who cared about the environment, could know what's happening inside Tibet behind this curtain of censorship. And his last message to those in exile he was communicating with was, um, I think if you don't hear from me, I've been detained and I have no regrets for what I've done. And that was the last message he sent before he died in, in, in custody, um, in Chinese government custody. And so now this is the story, this is the voice that those in exile have an opportunity to amplify. And I think that when we don't build those infrastructures, those systems to make sure that there are Tibetans in exile who can communicate, speak the language and make sure that they're maintaining that movement, uh, there is this huge piece of the story that's being lost behind censorship, behind walls of censorship, like Kunchuk Jinpa's story that might've been that might have been lost with him, but now remains um, on in the voices of those in exile who amplify the stories. So I suppose that would be my lesson, although I hope it's one that Hong Kongers and Uyghurs never have to um, deal with firsthand. And how about, and are you able to communicate some of that back into Tibet or is it diff as difficult for you as it is for Zamratai? I, I can really relate with Zamratai when she says that even if the, I had family inside Tibet who, who were 
like even if I have or I do have family inside Tibet who I could speak with, I would make the decision not to speak with them because, or I do make the decision not to speak with them because I know that my actions in exile, my use, like me grabbing the free speech that I have and using it to provide a platform and amplify the stories of those in Tibet would directly affect their safety and well-being. I think that's something that a lot of Tibetan youth have to decide. It's in exile, there's always a moment in a Tibetan young person's life where they have to decide whether they want to, you know, the moment that Nathan was talking about, step out and be the person who could be the, the amplification, the microphone for those that are um, really suffering or whether they, they don't have that capacity at the moment. And I think that's the decision that uh, any young Tibetan act activist you see in any spotlight or any stage or any with any microphone, that person has grappled with that in their lifetime as Zumartai and I both have. Um, let me now turn to Tang Bao and ask him that question too. Um, what, what has the experience of being in exile meant for you? Has it, has it given you some access to new tools? And how do you, um, how do you think about your relationship to your colleagues and friends at home in China? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so um, the human rights situation is uh, deteriorating uh, sharply in China. And what's happening in Xinjiang is literally genocide and, and Tibet, uh, has been listed by Freedom House as the the worst uh, region uh, regarding human rights and freedom. So, uh, human rights movement and and uh, uh, civil society in China are facing a very very uh, difficult time, and uh, and the, the risk is much higher than before. Um, so, uh, but we have to uh, continue our fight. And uh, for me, I kept uh, keep regular contact with Chinese uh, human rights defenders and, and lawyers and activists. Uh, it's not easy, but, um, uh, but we still have the, uh, the, the, the channels uh, to, uh, to connect. Um, and uh, in terms of the, uh, the uh, approaches and strategies, um, I always say that um, we should not have one single strategy. Um, everyone, every NGO, every human rights defender should uh, they consider and calculate their own resources, their own energy, their own uh, advantages, and and own risk, and then uh, and then they can um, create uh, their own strategy uh, uh, best suitable for uh, for their own. Um, and um, so it's um, you know the the, the censorship in China uh, uh, has been uh, more strict. And, and uh, VPN is, is, is harder than before to get the VPN uh, to circumvent the Great Firewall. Um, um, and, and in this context, the, uh, the self-censorship, uh, more and more people practice uh, self-censorship and the Chinese government uh, could use all kinds of suppressions and uh, like torture, uh, disappearance uh, to silence more and more human rights activists. Um, and um, so it's uh, it's really uh, difficult. Uh, of course, the, uh, what Tibetans and the Uyghurs um, are, are facing uh, more brutal uh, suppression and crackdown. Um, but um, uh, we cannot give up. Uh, we have to think up some some new um, creative uh, strategies and uh, approaches uh, to fight uh, the. Uh, totalitarianism. So it's it, one thing is uh, the, uh, the high technology, um, you know, for the past two or three decades, uh, because of the development of uh, uh, internet and social media, uh, we human rights uh, activists and civil society uh, could uh, use all those kind of uh, technologies to uh, develop our uh, repertoires and the human rights movement. Uh, but um, so it, it, it empowers um, civil society. But on the other hand, the Chinese government uh, could uh, use and misuse the uh, high technology to establish and strengthen uh, what I call high technology totalitarianism. And uh, um, so, like uh, the VP, like uh, the uh, the big data, uh, the DNA collection, facial recognition recognition, uh, artificial intelligence, all kinds of new technology have been used to tighten the uh, total control on society. 
So it's more and more difficult to organize um, resistance and, um, and mobilize people. Mm -hmm. um, Nathan, in your book, you write very movingly about the last time you got on a plane and left Hong Kong um, and your awareness of what it meant to be leaving and maybe not returning for a long time. Um, how do you think about exile? Um, how do you, uh, you know, can you make something positive out of it? Can you, can, can you use it for something good or does it, does it seem, um, you know, do you feel, do you feel far away from, from the people who's, who, you know, on whose behalf you worked for so many years? There are a few things that I've been reminding myself when I'm in exile. Um, first of all, try to have as much knowledge uh, as you can about where you come from, uh, about Hong Kong. It's really easy for you to lose grip of reality uh, when you are outside of Hong Kong, when you cannot like properly engage with people there. But I think it's crucial for us um, exhausting our own avenues to have an understanding towards it because that is how you can keep relevant there and how you can, um, maybe you're doing advocacy work outside of it, but you can still have an understanding of how people think and represent them in certain sense, uh, it's easy for us to uproot uh, ourselves, but I, I think our minds have to be in that place. And secondly, is of course have um, a, a diaspora community or have grassroots movement in our own community. And I think the Uyghur community and Tibetan community have been doing phenomenal in this regard to bring togetherness and to um, to glue the community. Um, that's, the only, that, that's the reason why we have a lot of momentum and, and a lot of, um, well, uh, uh, movement available outside of uh, the place so that we can make an impact. <laughs> and of course, uh, it's really important for us to continue to um, uh, bear in mind how we can build credibility. It's really easy to lose credibility, but it's really difficult to build one. Um, we have to understand local politics. We have to understand how we can interact with um, all the key stakeholders, human rights organizations um, that can provide a lot of resources and knowledge and we can build our supports uh, in our own communities and make sure that um, we are doing it for the people. Um, I think uh, living in exile is not an easy task, but uh, we just have to bear in mind that we're all in a mission and we cannot give up. Thank you. Um so the nature of all of your advocacy movements are, of course, very different and they have different origins and they emerge from very different kinds of activism. Um, but let me ask you, um, what are, are there causes that all of you can rally around? Are there things that you have in common, common areas that you can work on? Um, what are the prospects for, for kind of sustained solidarity? And let me ask that question both in terms of what are the issues in terms of talking about and understanding China that unite you, but also what are the issues in, you know, in the United States and in Europe? Um, how can you work together to change policy here, you know, among, um, you know, how, how can you change the, the Western conversation? Is that possible? And what direction would you like it to go? What would you like to see happen in Washington, in Berlin, in Paris, in London? Um, over the next few years, how what, what could we do? We, you know, we outside of China, what could we do to help? Um, let me again start with Zamrate, but I'll, I'll I'll switch up the order this time a little bit. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. Um, I mean, I think for us, there are a lot of different things that we have in common. Just if we take, for example, the campaign that both Pema and I, we've been, and Tang Biao as well, been working on for the past year, the No Beijing 2022 campaign, which regroups really over 200 organizations. That includes Uyghur, Tibetan, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, Southern Mongolians, and some other Chinese democracy activists. We've been working under this campaign for the past year um, under the same message calling world governments, athletes, sponsors, broadcasters, national Olympic committees, and any other stakeholders related to the games to not basically attend the Beijing uh, Olympic games in, in February. And this is because uh, there are, of course, um, grave, egregious human rights violations. I mean, the Uyghur tribunal just last week 
uh, ruled that there was a genocide happening in my country. And I think this is this was such a powerful campaign and I was inspired just along the way working with different activists from different backgrounds and communities because we were so you know, united um, under this campaign. We did so much together and our strong uh, message really made the headlines. Um, and I think there is strength in, in number and I think uh, a, a few committed people can change a lot. And I think we have, um, you know, beyond this campaign, there are a lot of other things that, that we can work on together. Uh, for example, China's rise to, to, you know, global power and also, um, China's uh, use of surveillance technology or any you know new technology to to uh, basically crack down on on people and how this technology is now being used elsewhere um, and how China's um, you know I guess um, China is now disturbing international um, order. And uh, you can clearly see that in institutions like the UN and and some other um, um, institutions and, and WHO, for example, as well. Um, so I think for us, uh, we have to make sure that we are united uh, to pass on a message that is that should be very clear to the audience. And that is China's uh, is rising to power and it is the second biggest um, you know, global economy. And we have to uh, use that as an opportunity to not only highlight, not only highlight our own issues, but to highlight the fact that if we let China become uh, the next big power, then we have to know, the, the rest of the international community has to know the consequences that um, it brings. Because I, you know, we always, have in the past few decades uh, advocated for our own rights and, and worried about our own rights. But now it's the rest of the international community that we're worried about because these surveillance technologies, these autocratic authority and ways are getting, you know, are crossing borders and it's influencing some other countries. And China is using that um, through um, projects like Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Depth Trap um, Diplomacy. Um, so we have to make sure that the world knows about these uh, dangers. Um, and um, I think we, we have a lot of opportunities uh, to work on, on these different um, issues at hand. So you're saying that, I mean, first of all, I'm going to continue on the question of the Olympics, but you're saying that um, by working together and by focusing on the ways in which China affects, you know, the democratic world, that this is a way to raise a way to raise awareness and, and um, you know, make people make people understand what's going on. Absolutely. I think um, there's a lot of misunderstandings or um, incomprehension about how China really works. And I think a lot of you know, countries still expect that quiet diplomacy, for example, still works with China, but it does not. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we've seen it clearly with the case of the two Canadian Michaels. Uh, I'm ca Canadian as well. And uh, seeing that happen to two Canadians who were not even Uyghur or Tibetans being detained for over two years for absolutely no reason was extremely hard to see. And what was even shocking was Canada's response to this. Um, fortunately, they were um, they were freed, but it took a lot of time and energy. And um, so that's why I think um, the world needs to, the, the perception on China needs to be changed. And I think us activists or different communities, we can work on that. Mm -hmm. um, Tang Bao, I'd like to ask you, um, I'll start with this question about the Olympics. Um, is this something that you think will be effective in China? Is a, we've, in fact, there is already a diplomatic boycott of the Olympics, so there will be no high level US officials going. Um, and I think several other countries have joined that now too. Um, is this something that you think is effective? Will it, will it have an impact inside China? Does it, does it matter? Is, is this the kind of thing that, um, that you know, these different exile communities should be working towards? Or are there other, um, you know, are there other goals? What, you know, what, what else could, you know, should you be pressuring the West to do? What would you like to see happen and what would you like to see change? Yeah, uh, Beijing has hosted uh, Summer Olympics in 2008 and now um, 
is going to host the Winter Olympics next February. So uh, Chinese government uh, wants to host these um, Olympics and other uh, sports events, not because they love sports, but because they want to um, propaganda, they want uh, legitimacy. And, and, and then uh, the most, most important thing uh, for Beijing is to have the world leaders, uh, president attending the opening ceremony, attending the uh, Olympics, and then, uh, and then they, they use this as an uh, endorsement. Um, so, uh, so we can't expect those uh, diplomatic uh, boycott or even a full boycott uh, would um, uh, arouse immediate uh, effect, immediate uh, consequence. Uh, but it's really important for international uh, human rights uh, communities for us um, because uh, because they kind of uh, boycott campaign uh, and the uh, the ongoing uh, diplomatic boycott. Uh, have raised more awareness and people uh, who are not familiar with uh, China uh, would ask uh, why uh, boycott Beijing Olympics and then and then people uh, would know what's happening in, in uh, Xinjiang, uh, Tibet, Hong Kong and and, and mainland China. Um, so uh, it's um, uh, it, you know uh, even uh, even if um, there is no immediate uh, result, the the the, uh, the boycott is the correct thing to do uh, because we could not all the uh, the sponsors the athletes the uh, organizations and the government uh, representatives should not go to Beijing to endorse the atrocities uh, by uh, the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and uh, in terms of the international uh, pressures, we, uh, together with uh, Tibetan and Uyghur and Hong Kong uh, organizations, um, you know, focus uh, the uh, influence operations, uh, like uh, not only Confucius Institute, uh, which uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, uh, infamous, uh, but also many other um, associations and organizations uh, under the umbrella of uh, United Front Work. Uh, like a, a CSSA Chinese Students and Scholars Associations, uh, Alumni Associations, Townsmen Associations, uh, Chamber of Commons, all kinds of um, uh, like seemingly uh, NGOs uh, uh, in the United States and other uh, countries actually uh, um, a long arm of Chinese, uh, Chinese government. So we have been uh, working together uh, to oppose uh, all these kind of um, uh, inf uh, influence operations, and and we'll continue to do that. So, uh, so, and that's where you think that the the different communities outside of China should be focused is on Chinese influence operations in democratic countries. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, important thing, and we have uh, achieved some uh, some goals, like in the United States. Um, they are used to have uh, more than 110 Confucius Institute. Now, uh, nearly 50% have been shut down or the, 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 the contract uh, have been ended. Um, and um, so uh, it's really important for the American people and, and you know, the, for the whole world to realize these kind of um, uh, influence uh, operations are not like a, a, a institution focusing on language, uh, teaching or culture exchange. It, it has a, a functions of uh, like uh, monitoring Chinese diaspora uh, and, and even like uh, spy uh, the stealing uh, secrets and, and, and uh, the intelligence like that. Um, and uh, of course we have, we have many other tasks, but uh, the, uh, to target these uh, influence uh, operations uh, uh, can, um, can be effective and can, can put uh, different uh, organizations, different uh, communities uh, together. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for those who don't, I'm sure most of the people on this call know, of course, that the Confucius Institutes were originally set up and they looked like very neutral you know, educational institutes where people would learn the Chinese language and calligraphy and things like that. And in fact, in, in many university campuses, not just in the US, but around the world, they were, as Deng Bao was explaining, they were used as 
um, tools of influence inside the university and, and, and in the community. Um, and it is true that campaigning by people like those on this, on this um, who are part of this conversation um, revealed them to be for what they are and many, as, as has just been said, are, are closing. So that is, a, that is an achievement. Um, um, let me turn to Pema. Um, you have also been working on the campaign um, regarding the Beijing Olympics. Um, again, can you talk about what your goals are um, and what the rest of us can do to ensure it's not a repeat of the Berlin Olympics of, of the 1930s? Um, even if as, I, if, as I suspect is likely, athletes do go. Um, I, I find it without some well, I don't know, but without some kind of major event between now and then, I find it hard to imagine that there will be no athletes, although I can I can imagine other kinds of boycotts. Um, what do you think is the is the the best way for us to to deal with and talk about this issue? Um, thank you, Tang Biao and Zimatai for uh, kind of being the, the field as well on the issue. For For me as a Tibetan, I think about the fact that like governments, athletes, sponsors, broadcasters, when they get off the plane in Beijing to attend the Olympics and be a part of the Chinese government's um, Beijing Olympics for 2022, they're essentially agreeing to join this weird event that legitimizes some of the worst human rights crackdowns and abuses of our entire generation. And although they may not you know, be there for that purpose, they're kind of just a small piece of that puzzle for the Chinese government. And I think the more of those pieces are there, the more this event will be remembered in history as being one that legitimized genocide. And as much as I mentioned, the Uyghur Tribunal is another report that was released this week uh, on Tuesday. So just when did exactly you explain, when just, when, can you explain in one sentence what the Uyghur Tribunal yeah. is for those who don't know? But, yeah. Sure. Uh, as much as I, would you like to explain in one sentence about the Uyghur Tribunals? Maybe that's better. Sure. I can just quickly say. Um, so it was an independent um, body that was established in 2020. Um, and it's a uh, legal experts that convened in London to really examine the question of whether China is committing genocide uh, or not against the Uyghurs. And uh, it was over, they took over a year to listen to testimonies of, from fact and expert witnesses. And they um, uh, basically came up with the judgment uh, last week in London. Right. Sorry, I interrupted you. Um... No, no, <laughs> uh, In addition to the, the, the verdict of that tribunal, which has been working extremely hard to prove without, beyond a reasonable doubt the case of genocide against the Uyghur people, there's also a report that was released that a compiled research of data that was actually data that's published by the Chinese government. And that um, that data now proves that uh, nearly 80 percent at the most conservative figures of Tibetan children between the ages of six and 18 years old are currently studying, living and being essentially raised by the Chinese government at residential boarding school programs. So that's 78 percent of all Tibetan children between the ages of six and 18 are being raised by the Chinese government right now whether forced or coerced um, or, you know, through tactics like shutting down locally run schools so that the only way for a family to give their child an education is by, you know, enrolling them in these residential boarding school programs. There are many tactics the government uses. Essentially, all of these things, the genocide, the residential boarding school programs in 2021, which, which are the aim of those is to basically stop an entire culture in its tracks within one generation. Within one generation, 80% of Tibetan adults inside Tibet could essentially have been raised by the Chinese government. So those are the goals. These are the types of goals we're looking at. It's not like the goal is, um, you know, to uh, silence one group of people for a sub, sub, you know, small period of time. It's to essentially eradicate entire groups, ethnic groups, identity groups, like religious groups of people and wipe them off the face of the earth. That's what we're looking at right now. And so every single country, diplomatic envoy, athlete, and, you know, sponsoring company that participates in the Olympics are essentially kind of saying that either they don't understand the political issue, which now at this point, uh, you know, with the hard work of Uyghurs like Zermatai and her colleagues with the Uyghur tribunals and reports like this one published by the Tibet Action Institute, you know, with that excuse is very weak. Or they're saying that, you know, business with China is more important than the survival of the Uyghur and the Tibetan people at this point in time for their government or their company. And so for me, the Uyghur, not attending the, the, the Olympic Games is more so saying, Actually, there is a red line, and that red line is genocide, the genocide of the Uyghur people, and the oppression, the, the brutal repression of the Tibetan people as well, which forcibly, forcible removal of one, child, one group's children to another group is actually also one of the criteria of genocide. 
on many, many levels, the Chinese government, what they're doing just goes beyond what, what was imaginable to most people. And I think the issue is that there's a misunderstanding of what our you know, campaign against the Chinese government might be. Uh, maybe the misunderstanding is that we are doing work against a human rights issue. But actually, the way that I see it is that this is completely just an issue of genocide. And there is this red line, and the Chinese government has crossed it in a way that very, very few governments of our current generation have crossed. So I think in that sense, there sets this precedence where the Chinese government and other, you know, other people around the world have an extra responsibility to say, where is that red line? Are we willing to cross it to participate in these games? And the question also comes to uh, broadcasters, for example, like NBC in the United States. They're not only uh, giving money to you know, further these Beijing games, they're actively, their job now is to promote these games. So we've just established that these games are being used by the Chinese government to legitimize their human rights abuses. And now an American you know, company broadcaster, NBC, they're actually tasked with the role of promoting these games and making them seem fun and exciting. That's literally their job for the next two months. So how does this play into their complicity in the genocide of the Uyghur people, in the disappearance of you know, relatives of Canadian Uyghurs like Zumertai, or the um, essentially kidnapping of Tibetan young people who, could, who are my family? We have Tibetan Americans and Uyghur Americans who are coming out and saying, just listen to us. And so I think that's kind of a big thing that we should start doing over the next months and years is actually turning to young people who are impacted by these issues like Nathan Laws and Mertai, uh, folks like Tang Biao who have seen these abuses firsthand and asking about you know, the nuanced understanding of the Chinese government, not just uh, you know, rhetoric or you know, this like Cold War narrative, kind of moving past that and saying, how can we actually talk to those most impacted and try to get a nuanced understanding of the issue and find the solutions that will benefit not just them, not just us, but actually the entire global community for generations to come. So mm -hmm. um, just to summarize where we are until now, you know, so we've we've when, when we're talking about what tactics, what what strategies can we work on together? Um, we've mentioned um, documenting human rights abuse, as in the case of the Uyghur Tribunal. We've mentioned exposing Chinese influence operations, as in the case of exposing what the Confucian Institutes do. Um, we've mentioned the Olympic boycott, and maybe there are other boycotts um, that we could talk about. Um, uh, Nathan, let me turn to you now um, and ask you, you know, you know, what else can what else can you all do as a community, or as three or four or five or ten communities um, in in exile in the West, in 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 Europe and America, um, in order to help people back in China, back in Hong Kong um in, in, improve their circumstances what are the, what are the other issues you can unify around and what are the tactics that you can promote it's obvious that the uyghurs tibetans chinese people and hong kong people we face the same source of repression but maybe it's less obvious that actually all of you are facing the same threats fighting for democracy for hong kong fighting for freedom for uyghurs and tibetans they're not just for us but for the world to have an awakening of how the Chinese expansionist authoritarianism are impacting the world and prevent us from falling into a situation that um, the people sitting around the table in the panel and in, in the core that we're facing. So I think connecting us um, to a larger community, to the global community, to the community that cares about freedom and democracy are crucial because what we're seeing is China, China is not only doing human rights atrocities internally, but they're actively exporting their models. They're actively discrediting democratic system and try to promote totalitarianism as the way to go in the world. So I think bringing us all together, not only people who are literally sub being suppressed um, on the front line, but also for democracies who cares about their values, who cares about their freedom together. I think this is a main mission for all of us. Right, great, thank you. Um, we, we have a, you know, 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, let me finish by asking, you know, all of you face um, really severe risks. Um, Zoom or Tai, you've already talked about your family um, who are at home and many have disappeared or are missing. Um, I've met other Uyghurs who have um, similar kinds of stories. Um, talk about, first of all, how you what kind of risks you personally face, how you cope with them, and, and also what, again, what could you expect from 
um, American from European governments in the way of help and protection? What more could be done to help you to make sure that you can continue um, your mission? Um, let me start again with Zamratai. Um, yeah, I mean, I've mentioned those risks um, back at home where, I mean, I've lost contact, like I said, um, since 2017. So I, I actually, you know, I know for sure that there are over 40 people uh, in my family that have been missing or detained in camps, but it might be more. Um, I have no idea because I don't have contact with them. Um, the only thing that I hear is from various sources, either from uh, media like Radio Free Asia or through contacts. Um, but I, al I always think um, it's, it's much worse than what I, what I know, what I think. Um, I have cousins, I have aunts, and just thinking how they might be subjected to rape in camps or sexual abuse, like forced sterilization, it breaks my heart. It makes my job very hard because I have to deal with this on a daily basis, uh, working with victim, victims every day. So there is also like a mental health component to this. Um, and all of us in our community in exile, we are facing these similar challenges where we're not stable, I don't think, mentally, because we have to deal with extreme trauma since um, since 2016, 2017. Um, so this will be this would be one of the you know the most urgent um, challenges that I'm facing. Um, but also knowing that um, I am always because I am exposed, you know. Um, I can be exposed to any threats from, from the Chinese government. They could basically track me. They know where I am, what I'm doing. They, I know that I'm being monitored. So really being in Germany or in Canada, I don't feel 100% safe like I would um, as, you know, if I was an, uh, an ordinary citizen. Um, and I think there's another challenge which is tied to the work that I do is trying to make my voice heard in different forums, um, whether it's at the UN or some other places. I do UN advocacy and anytime I go there um, to represent the Uyghurs and, and our plight, I'm always faced with enormous challenges because China is always there as a global power and you see how they use all the tactics available and they have the resources to, do, to uh, basically have many different countries back them. Um, anytime that you know Western governments come up with a statement to support Uyghurs, Tibetans, Hong Kongers, China gathers over 70 countries to uh, basically counter, uh, counter react to that. And so for me, that's another challenge because a lot of doors are closed to us. Um, for example, some countries, Muslim majority countries do not wanna hear from us. How is it possible that you know, this is the biggest, one of the biggest crises in the Muslim world today. And no Muslim country has spoken out on this. So for me, that represents another challenge because I am Muslim and I expect, you know, my Muslim and bro brothers and sisters to speak up for me. But these governments are, um, are not at all. And they're actually doing the opposite, which is actively supporting and, and defending China's genocidal policies. Um, so this, this, you know, makes it very difficult to uh, to feel like you're advancing um, in these different uh, environments and spaces. Um, and at the same time, you know, China can use their power and influence uh, over, you know, different countries. Just in October, Pema and I, we were um, in Greece, in Athens and Olympia to, um, in, the, in the context of our Olympics campaign because the, the Olympic torch was being handed to Beijing and Pema got arrested and detained. I was not arrested because um, I was, I mean, I guess I wasn't part of the protest, but I was there for a press, press conference and we were being tailed by uh, some Chinese individuals and some even local uh, people who were tailing us. And the Greek police, you know, arrested all of our Tibetan Hong Kong friends. And I mean, I did not expect, you know, as a Canadian living in Germany, going to Greece, a member of the European Union, democ where democracy was born to, you know, to be followed by people like this for expressing our, uh, for using our freedom of expression. Um, so these are 
ongoing challenges that we face, but I think I am not, I find comfort in knowing that I'm not alone. And I know that um, we are making sure that governments hear these challenges and that they provide adequate tools and resources to not only identify th these challenges, but also to help us uh, overcome these challenges. Um, and I hope that um, we can, we can do more um, and, and I hope that governments will, will do more to protect their own citizens. Mm -hmm. um, Teng, Teng Bao, f picking up on that, I'm wondering if there are special risks for you um, in even, uh, you know, in, in talking to activists from Hong Kong, Tibet um, and, and, and the Uyghur community. Um, you know, are, does, does the Chinese government see a special threat from the unification of these movements and from their connection to the mainland, uh, to the democracy activism in, in mainland China? Yeah, um, so when I was in China, um, because of my human rights activities, uh, I had been uh, disbarred and fired uh, by the university and uh, uh, kidnapped, detained and tortured. And then when I left China, uh, my family uh, were prevented from leaving China. So they were used by Chinese government as hostages to punish me and silence me. And uh, while well, uh, I'm, I'm here that uh, in the United States, a free country, uh, I can still feel the, the, the threat and intimidation from the Chinese government. And like, a, a, you know, almost every Chinese um, uh, has, um, uh, has, uh, has family mem uh, members or, or relatives in, in in China, and then the, the Chinese government could use them as uh, hostages, and and um, so um, and uh, uh, I received uh, death threat uh, from uh, from uh, social media, um, and, uh, and 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 also um, my talks at uh, Ivy League universities uh, were cancelled because of the pressure uh, from uh, from Chinese uh, Chinese. Uh, students and scholars associations. Um, so, so China's long arm uh, uh, is um, more and more uh, aggressive and uh, and influential. Um, and and the, the the solidarity among uh, Chinese dissidents, uh, Tibetans, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, and other um, other groups, uh, of course, um, is seen by the Chinese government as a, as a threat. And and then uh, uh, they. Uh, they intensified the, the censorship and the propaganda. So one thing I, I, I want to uh, point out briefly here is um, the, the uh, Han chauvinism. So many, many Chinese people uh, embraced uh, the idea of uh, uh, Han chauvinism and even Chinese activists. Uh, and they uh, kind of uh, discriminate against uh, uh, Tibetans, Muslims, Uyghurs, and, and other minority groups. So, uh, so I, I feel it's really, really uh, disappointing. And, and uh, I, I hear call for the, the, the Han Chinese people, especially uh, Han Chinese human rights defenders, to, to give up those, um, uh, those uh, idea of uh, Han chauvinism and racism. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's uh, totally unacceptable when you say you are supportive of human rights and, and uh, well, you, you ignore and undermine the freedom and the dignity of uh, other, um, other nation or people. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Um, that's a really important point. Um, I, I think historically the mainland Chinese activists have not worked with activists from the minority communities and from Hong Kong. So um, if this is a change, it's, it's a really important one. Um, let me ask now just for a short comment from Pema on, on this same issue. How do you deal with the risks? Um, how do you think about them? Um, and what could be done to lessen them or to make your job, your, your, your task less frightening? Uh, yeah, I think similar, like Zomata was mentioning about um, being in a democratic country like Greece. Uh, I mean, for me, there was, this, you know, we were in Olympia, we were being tailed, we were detained um, by the Greek police under the order of the local Chinese consulate. Um, we actually witnessed a discussion between the member representative of the consulate, asking them, telling the Greek police, please detain these people as they are speaking to the media at our event. So we were standing on sidewalks speaking to the media and we were detained. 
And the next day they actually came to our press conference as well, they being like operatives from the Chinese government. And there was a moment when I, you know, I went to the bathroom and they came out and there was someone from the Chinese operas standing right there asking questions to us. And I remember he was just looking in my eyes and I realized that if I was a young person inside Hong Kong right now, inside Tibet right now, or inside East Turkestan right now, this might be the last person whose face I would see before I'm detained and possibly never see my family again. And so being in a democratic country, I felt a sense of safety, but that safety was extremely shaken by the fact that there were so many Chinese operatives who were allowed to walk around freely and even liaise with the Greek authorities in some cases. Um, and there was a moment, I think, where the young people like Zumartai, myself, and some of our Hong Kong friends as well, um, such as Joey, who we suddenly realized actually how safe are we? Um, we are in a democratic country, but there are Chinese operatives walking around freely in front of Greek authorities, questioning us, um, in some cases following us, and nothing is being done. In fact, the only thing that's being done is we're being detained. And how safe are we? I think that this is one thing that democratic countries can do is to um, really keep an open line of communication with young activists who are putting their family at risk 100% and also themselves. Like when we um, you know, stand up to be activists and uh, campaigners for our causes, we're basically putting a radar on ourselves and showing ourselves because we have to speak with the media, with the government, with our grassroots bases. We're essentially telling this government that we know is extremely corrupt, extremely violent and extremely um, authoritarian where we are all the time. Um, and that's essentially a, a risk that we take. And we, we take that, I take that risk myself um, with, without a second thought, because I know that those inside Tibet take much, much greater risks every day to be activists. Um, but I think in democratic countries, one thing that, that is really helpful is to keep an open line of communication with especially young activists from impacted communities and seeing um, how they're being impacted by the work that they're, they're doing. Okay, and also not, sorry, also not waiting until the moment where they're in risk, but also seeing like a nuanced understanding of why are they at risk in the first place? It's because of the way this government operates and how can we try to uh, combat that at the root as opposed to just when there is a case of um, you know, direct risk to their lives or their safety. Sorry for yeah. that. So th thank you. No, I just, we're, we're now at the very end and I wanted to make sure that Nathan had the last word. <laughs> Um, you know, you've, you've been very eloquent on the subject of, um, you know, those in the West needing to understand that this system affects them. Um, you, you know, you've, 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 you've spoken about why it matters. Um, you know, what, you know, what idea would you like to leave us with? You know, you have, you have now, you're surrounded by colleagues from different walks of life, from different parts of, um, from different parts of, of China and the Chinese diaspora. Um, you know, how, how would you like to sum up the conversation? Well, uh, thank you so much to my counterparts. They've been doing an enormous uh, amount of work and their bravery have been impacting the whole community and reminding us how are the situations in mainland China. They're brutal. They are committing a lot of human rights uh, violations and crimes against humanities. And this, these are stories that should have been told um, to many of the people around the world in, in this country. And for us, even though we are facing an enormous amount of risk and pressure, we'll try to mitigate that, but we're definitely not going to give up. We're definitely going to um, do whatever it takes us to go back home because this is our mission. And if we are intimidated and, we, and if we draw back, um, that would uh, actually be a victory of the Chinese Communist Party and we're not going to let it happen. So thank you so much for um, all your hard work and I think that will be a long way of collaboration and working together and understanding each other. And I think um, the world is waking up. And I really do hope that um, the trends of change of tides towards the Chinese Communist Party could pave us uh, our way home. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks to all of you. Um, once again, this is Nathan's book, uh, Freedom, How We Lose It and How We Fight Back. Um, I really enjoyed hearing from you, um, hearing your various perspectives, um, and hope that we can all continue working together in the future. So thank you very much, and thanks to the audience for joining. Thank you so thank much. You